Uh, if you would turn with me again to 2 Corinthians, and we'll uh, pick up kind of where we left off last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I will read from verse 5 to the end of the chapter, but we'll primarily consider just a portion of that uh, today. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I mean chapter 7, verse 5. For even when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Let's pray. Fathers, we open up your word today. I pray that, uh, that this will be a section of scripture that we can see um, not only Paul demonstrating a love for uh, his brothers and those that are in his church, but also how we should be, how we should treat others, and how we should respond when we do wrong. Uh, we pray that, I pray that you will allow me to speak clearly, uh, understanding, um, and that we may get edified from this. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. And so probably the... Uh, a title for this particular section may be Comfort That Comes Out of Conflict. And that's, uh, that kind of characterizes that whole section that I read to you today. Uh, and it's uh, and in 2 Corinthians, if we talked about the last few weeks, this is a very heartfelt letter by Paul. You know, Paul, Paul pours out his love uh, for the church um, in this letter, 2 Corinthians. Uh, he speaks it in chapter 2 when he says that when he wrote this, or um, <clears throat> um, I wrote you much affliction, many tears, and not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. And in chapter 80, he um, says, but as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness, in our love for you. And in verse 11, in chapter 11, he says, uh, because I, he says, and why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. So he loved the Corinthian church. He loved it with the, uh, the godly love that was necessary to do what was necessary to call them back from the false teachers and from the divisions that they were having. So as you recall, again, the context after he wrote 1 Corinthians, um, Paul, uh, another problem arose in the church, uh, this uh, problem of false teachers coming in. And these teachers were... You know, there's already division in the Corinthian church. They're already divided among things. They seem to be easily uh, bent that way to, for that to happen. Uh, but he makes a visit now to address this, and he describes it in chapter 2, verse 1, as a painful visit, a painful visit. 
And we spoke last time, we don't know exactly what happened, but it seems that he was either verbally attacked by either these false teachers or someone in the church who sided with these false teachers. Um, and the church didn't come to his defense. They kind of just let it happen. And it seemed like that um, Paul was abandoned by the church, like he had lost them to these false teachers. So Paul was hurt, anguished. It was a painful visit, as he says. So he returns to Ephesus, and then he, says, and then he writes his other letter that we're going to talk about today called the severe letter. Um, he uh, said that he, this painful visit caused him not to want to come visit him again, so he writes a letter to them, a severe letter. It's not one that we have in the New Testament, but it's one he refers to in this passage that we're going to talk about. Um, so he returns to Ephesus, he writes this severe letter, uh, is what we'll refer to it as, um, and he sends Titus then back to the church at Corinth to see how this letter affected them. Okay, he, he may have sent the letter with Titus, we don't know that, but we know that Titus, his, his, his son in Christ, his, his spiritual son, someone who spoke for Paul, he sent him back to, Corinthian, to Corinth to find out what effect that letter had on the church at Corinth. And you can imagine he, he, he didn't know the outcome of that. You know, were they gonna, was it going to make him more angry? Was it going to push him farther away? Uh, because he refers to it as severe, and it's going to cause him grief. It's going to cause him sorrow. It was, it was to the point. It was what they needed to hear about the sin that they had uh, committed against Paul and the truth. So Paul didn't know exactly how that was going to turn out. Meanwhile, he gets a, a opportunity in Troas, which, we, uh, which he describes back in chapter 2, a ministry opportunity, and he goes there expecting to have a report from Titus. But Titus isn't there. And so Paul's um, spirit is, uh, um, uh, he can't concentrate. His, his spirit was restless. He couldn't perform what he needed to do. So he went on to Macedonia. And so that's where it picks up in where we are today in chapter 7, verse 5. When he spokes, he comes to Macedonia. He's still afflicted. You know, Macedonia was not a place that really loved Paul uh, because of what had gone on there when he founded the church. Certainly the church people loved Paul, but not the town itself. So he was still afflicted. Um, he was still crushed on the inside. He, he was sorrowful. But then God sent Titus. Titus shows up, and he was comforted. And he was comforted not just because his old friend Titus showed up, although that, that is certainly comforting, but he was comforted because of the report Titus gave. They had repented. The church at Corinth had come back to Paul. They had, um, uh, it was what Paul wanted to hear. And so Paul was comforted. And in verse 7, um, he says, um, not only were we comforted by his coming, uh, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me. All those describe the Corinthians' feelings now for Paul that Titus brought back. And so all that kind of revealed that they were now and had been loyal to Paul. <clears throat> that longing, that earnest desire, that mourning over that breach of the relationship they had because what they had done to Paul. And then their zeal for him. Uh, that zeal is a great word because it, it really is kind of a... Uh, a combination of, of love and hate. It's, it's, it's that you love something so much that you kind of hate anything that affects that or, or talks bad about it. Um, Psalm 69.9, David says, zeal for your house consumed me, or in the King James, zeal for your house has eaten me up. You know, he was at this point, uh, all those that were against him and they were desecrating the house of the Lord but David had that zeal that it made him angry uh, at anything that would, uh, uh, that would be against that. And then in, uh, in John, it, it spoke to when, when Christ came into the temple, saw what was happening into the temple, turns over the, 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 uh, uh, the money changers, uh, turns over the table and, and gets spiritually angry, I guess you can say, 
uh, it was also spoken in that that his disciples remembered zeal for your house uh, would consume me. So, so Christ had that zeal that his house was not being taken care of. He loved the house of God that anything else that desecrated it or was against it, he hated. So that's kind of zeal. It's, 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 a, it's an emotion. It's a feeling that uh, is kind of a combination there. And then he comes to, to verse 8, and that's where we're kind of concentrate today, verse 8 through 10. Um, and I'll just read again the beginning there. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. So first of all, you have to ask yourself, letter, what's he referring to? Some of the older commentators actually think that that letter is, is referring to 1 Corinthians and some of the severe things that he approached um, in that letter. But it doesn't seem to fit the painful visit that he speaks of and everything like that. So, so we have to assume that this letter he's referring to is what we're going to call the severe letter. It's not part of our New Testament, but it's what Paul is referring to here, a letter that he wrote in response to what had happened to him at Corinth. For, the, for he had been treated poorly, unfairly. The church had... Uh, defected from him almost during that visit. Uh, so Paul writes this letter, um, uh, and and thinking Paul writes this letter out of a feeling that he had been deserted by the church at Corinth. Okay, they had treated him poorly. He thinks they had lost him, been deserted, um, and Paul was no stranger to being deserted. You know, in his very last letter, he spoke of at his first defense. Nobody came. They've all deserted me. You know, Demas in love with this world. Um, Paul knew that that letter, which needed to be written to confront the sin at the church at Corinth, was not going to be pleasant. That's why we call it a severe letter. It addressed the issue with truth, but in love. But it wasn't going to be pleasant to the offender. Anytime you're convicted of sin or your, your sin is brought to you, it's not pleasant. You know, it always produces something in you, either anger, sorrow, uh, or something like that. And it's really no different than, than as we're raising children and, and punishing children. We will, there's, there's an offense that's committed by one of our children, we'll say. It needs to be addressed, okay? It needs to be addressed in truth, but firmly. And so when we did that to children, it, you've all been there, you, you can be really harsh with it, but as long as it's in truth and they understand, you know, you, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But you really don't know how they're going to respond to it. You know, are they going to, is it going to make them more angry? Are they going to go the opposite direction? It's, it's that unknown, but it needs to be addressed. Just like a sin in the church and, and church discipline, uh, it needs to be addressed. It's a necessary part of keeping the church pure. Uh, but again, you don't know how they're going to respond to it. You certainly need to do it like Paul did it in a, in a truthful, loving manner. But the result is unknown to you when you do that. So you're always kind of second guessing. And that's why Paul said in, in verse 8, he said, I know for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't regret it. Well, he doesn't regret it because he already knows that that it worked, that they repented. So I don't regret it from that standpoint. But then he always says the other thing, but I did regret it. So it's always kind of when he's writing the letter, you know, it's always that little regret. Is this too severe? Is this something? Or how are they going to respond? Um, so correction needs to be done in, in several situations. You know, wayward spouse as well. You know, the issue needs to be um, addressed uh, it needs to be addressed in truth, but you don't know how it's going to end up. So you're always kind of on the uh, defense. I, I might regret doing this, so you didn't know that. But, but we know from the Bible that all discipline, all things like this, uh, is painful at the time. But we also got to remember what it produces, what discipline produces. And that's what Paul is kind of faced with here. But he didn't write this, this letter out of, out of anger to the church at Corinth. He was hurt. But he wasn't angry. He didn't want to get even with them. He didn't want to make them sorrowful and grieve just to make them sorrowful and grieve. Uh, 
you know, no, he wanted, he wrote it for the purpose. He wrote it out of much anguish and tears uh, and love for them. And so when he says, I, I do not regret it again, he, he doesn't regret writing the lay, doesn't regret that it grieved them, okay? Um, he says, I do not regret that because it had its intended purpose, um, and he knew the outcome. He doesn't regret writing it at any means, but while he was writing it, he had some second thoughts about it. You can imagine. Paul's human. He's not, uh, he is a saint, and this is what saint means. Not saint is like uh, the Catholic Church calls saints, but uh, he is a saint. But he's human. He has those same feelings and those same unknowns that we have, especially in this particular situation while disciplining the church. And that's why, and that's really why I think many churches don't address church discipline because they don't know, number one, they, uh, they don't have a, a really um, uh, strong uh, desire to follow God's word as it's stated, and they don't know by church discipline how that's going to happen? Is it you know? Is it what's going to happen? Are they going to get angry and leave? Which possibly that's what they need to do in that particular case. Um, but it's something that has to be done. But as we know, most churches will shy away from that just because of conflict that may arise. Um, so he saw then that it grieved. I guess we're still in in verse eight. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. And so the reason. It grieved them only for a while because they repented, okay? The grief was short-lived. Um, it's been said that, that, that sin, you know, in sin, in repentance, the pain or the sorrow goes away. It's short-lived, but the pleasure of the restoration with the Holy God is forever, okay? Sin, on the other hand, without repentance, has pleasure for a while, but the sorrow and the grief and what it causes and the death remains forever. So repentance is a very, that's what Paul is speaking of here in this section. So in verse 9 then, he says this, um, as it is, I rejoice. Okay, he knew they had repented, so he rejoiced from that. He, and he rejoiced not because this letter grieved him, but it grieved him into repenting. Okay, so he wasn't just trying to get even. He wasn't just doing this out of anger. He was doing this for a purpose. Um, and that grief that it caused had its intended purpose, and that was the repentance of the church at Corinth. Um, so uh, repentance, let's talk about that for a minute. What, what is it? Okay, Paul describes it in context here. Um, it's definitely different than just being sorry. It's definitely different than the sorrow produced by the sin that you have. Uh, it's, it's not just being sorry for what you did, although sorrow may accompany repentance. It's different. It's different. Um, sorrow alone accomplishes nothing. It's just, it's just a feeling. It's just a, uh, something that you feel inside. So you can, be, you can definitely be sorrow sorry about sinning but never repent of it okay so sorrow itself is uh is just really a feeling repentance on the other hand again describes a change describes a change in mind and a change in action so the sorrow that he speaks of here uh this godly sorrow that he describes it as is um is a sorrow that in and of itself doesn't prove anything. But when, uh, when we look at it from God's standpoint, if this sorrow and how you respond to it is in the will of God, it will lead you to repentance. That's the kind of sorrow that Paul's letter produced in the Corinthian church, a godly sorrow. And so he contrasts that with the worldly sorrow, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But a good example of that, Godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow would be Peter sinned grievously okay, by denying the Lord, but repented of that sin and became a leader in the church. 
All right? Okay. Judas grieved seriously. Okay. But that ended up in him killing himself. Okay. So he did not repent in a godly manner, but but was sorry for what he did. Remember, he, he took the money and he threw it back. I'm sorry I did this, but never repenting. Okay? So when he says here that the godly, uh, the godly sorrow, the godly grief produces repentance, worldly grief, just being sorry for what you have, produces death and sin. So that's kind of the difference here. So sorrow, but sorrow and grief can certainly be one of the things that God uses to lead you back to himself. And that's what, that's what the letter that Paul wrote here did. It soured him, it grieved him, it was, it was to the point, uh, but it led to a change in the Corinthian church. And that's how you know it's godly sorrow, because it leads to a repentance. Um, now that word repentance, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a harsh word and churches don't like to speak about that anymore. But, but in many places it's described as the first word of the gospel. Okay, John the Baptist's first word, repent. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' first words, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. On the day of Pentecost, what did uh, Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized. It's one of the things that is a necessary part of salvation. Um, but many churches will, will shy away from that, and they'll talk mainly about God's love and, um, and how in spite of your sin, God loves you. And, you know, if you, if you go on sinning, God still loves you. He'll forgive those sins too. You know, they, they won't approach that a, a holy God, uh, if we are truly believers, a holy God wants everything we do to glorify him. And so they, they, they kind of miss that part. He says, all you got to do is believe. You know, that's, that's believe. And we know that that's not all you have to do. But believing and repentance, faith and repentance, they, they go hand in hand. So, and some describe repentance as, um, they'll say, okay, I acknowledge repentance, but repentance is when you change your mind about who Jesus is. So repentance, I'm going from thinking Jesus was just this guy that, you know, lived 2,000 years ago to to who he is, okay, so there, I repented, I, that, that makes me saved, but that's not what repentance talk. we're obviously talking about something different here, and then many will say repentance is just nothing more than a work, uh, a work that you get rewards for, but you can be saved without repentance, you can be part of the children of God without repentance, well, we think the Bible links sorrow, godly sorrow, uh, producing repentance, salvation, all in this verse right here. So, it's, um, <clears throat> let's see, verse uh, 10, uh, he says, again, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Okay, so does that mean that um, we're saved by our repentance? Did this grief produce this repentance, and then that repentance led to salvation? Really not exactly, okay, but repentance is a necessary condition for salvation. Uh, Spurgeon called it the twin sister of faith. So faith and repentance go together. So when does repentance, uh, when does that take place in salvation? Well, it's hard to say it's kind of all at the same time, because if you come to a saving faith, if, if, if you come to uh, uh, Christ, uh, that, that uh, God's grace now um, opens your eyes to the truth of the gospel, he puts the Holy Spirit inside you where you then now um, uh, understand with faith, you're convicted of your sin by that spirit inside you, and you understand by faith that God's word is true and every part of it's true, and that maybe you have been sinning and doing things against that, okay, that you will repent because now you understand that God's word is true. Okay, it will lead you to repentance, that sorrow for your sin, that knowledge now that there's this holy God and I've been doing all this sinning uh, up till now and that's not what he wants me to do, okay? So, so he's granted me 
through grace is faith that I have now in his word and what he says. And so I'm going to change. It's going to produce a change in me. That's what repentance does. Um, you can't be in the sphere of salvation without a repentant heart, without a heart that repents from your sin. Um, and that's because now as, as being part of God's children, we have the Spirit living in us, and that Spirit will convict us of sin, okay? And that sin will produce a godly grief in us that Paul talks about here, and that will lead us to repentance. That will lead us to repentance. And then unto salvation. Well, it's all part of the same process. Okay, it's not that you have to first repent from your things and then God will save you. No, that repentance that we talk about is also a gift of God. It's a gift of God, just like everything that has to do with salvation. Your faith <coughs> through grace, your faith, um, your repentance, <coughs> excuse me, your repentance, it's all a gift of God. Uh, a couple of verses that speak to that, um, that it's a gift of God. Uh, Acts eleven eighteen, 18, um, Peter said this, when they heard these things, they fell silent, they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So God will grant that repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance, but God grants that repentance to you. Um, 2 Timothy 2.25, uh, Paul's word to Timothy says, uh, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So that repentance that we show is granted by God through the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, and in Romans 2, 4, Paul says, uh, uh, or do you not presume on the riches and the kindness and the forbearance, of pat uh, and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So like everything in salvation, it's from God. It's granted to us uh, by God. So repentance is not a work. It's not, um, it's not something we get rewarded to. It's part of being a saved individual. It's part of being a true believer. Um, and as true believers, with the indwelling spirit, our words, our actions, everything should glorify God. That is part of it. Um, <clears throat> so godly sorrow, godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly sorrow means sorrow according to God's will. Uh, sorrow that, that has its intended effect for God, again, is mediated by the Spirit. The Spirit will convict us of that sin and make us sorrowful for it. <clears throat> and then we understand our sin is wrong. We repent unto salvation. Uh, it's not that that repentance save us, but because we are saved, we will repent. Okay. So then with, he says that it produces uh, a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Well, no one who truly repents and is, in, and is part of the uh, true believer ever regrets repenting ever regrets even the sorrow that caused that repentance matter of fact they will rejoice in that sorrow that god sent that sorrow the holy spirit convicted you of that sorrow um, and they'll embrace it and the corinthians by their response to paul letters proved by their actions that they were true believers that's who he's speaking to now as in all churches you know this, i'm probably talking about the majority in the corinthian church uh, in all churches, there may be uh, hairs among the wheat, but uh, the majority repented of what they had um, uh, what they had done to Paul. And so we need to understand that that true biblical repentance is is a spiritual act. it's It's of the spirit, okay? It's mediated by the spirit. And it's not just, like so many people think of kind of a behavioral modification uh, that, you know, <clears throat> uh, now if I do this, this, and this, I'll, I'll have less stress. I'm not going to worry as much, you know, get me out of this problem. Um, you know, that may change your life for a while, 
But true biblical repentance will change your life, but it will change it uh, towards God and forever. So it's not just a modification of what you do. It's not just a, a change. It's not just being sorry, I'm going to change things a little bit. But it, but it is through the Spirit, it changes you. It heals you from that sin that you had. It heals you from the sorrow that sin has caused uh, in your life and to others. Um, so it doesn't just, uh, repentance is not just something you do to improve your life. Um, but it's an inward spiritual change mediated by the spirit but it has visible effects it's going to change you okay it's not just something to say well, i repented from that and kind of keep doing what i was doing it's going to have visible effects in a change in a change of actions so let me just briefly go back to verse nine at the end of verse nine paul has a little says a little verse here that kind of is not exactly sure. It's, it's a little bit um, uh, difficult to understand. At the very uh, last sentence in verse 9, he says, For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. So what does Paul mean by that? That's a little vague. Is there's no loss through us. Well, a couple of, a couple of ideas here, a couple of commentators that I read, and they kind of differ. But one thing is, is that Paul, when he addressed them in the severe letter, he, he wrote that letter in a godly manner, the truth in love, for the purpose of restoring his relationship to the Corinthians and restoring them to God, right? So Paul maybe by saying here, since he did it in that manner, you know, I'm not the one that suffered the loss of our relationship. I'm not the one that, that caused you to stray from God. He goes, it's not us that did that. That's one idea of why he might be seen. Another one is that term suffered loss is used kind of only one other time, and that's back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when, when he's talking about um, our works as, uh, uh, as Christians, you know, precious stones, silver, gold, or wood, hay, and stubble. You know, that, that you can have works that will last forever, that will... Uh, make it through the fire, or you'll have those that burn up at the end, though you will be saved by fire. I mean, though, though you will be saved, okay? So he, he's speaking kind of about rewards for what you do here on earth. So he's saying, well, if I bring you back, you know, if you come back to the true word of God and everything that I have taught you, the word of God have taught you, you're going to be more likely to do the precious stones, silver, and gold, and not suffer loss by following the false teachers, you know, doing things that don't matter, wood, hay, and stubble, rituals, things like that. Just a couple ideas there. I'm not sure which one he's talking about, but he, he uh, those are a couple ideas. And then um, let's talk then about godly grief versus worldly grief, or godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. Again, we spoke of sorrow is, is, is the feeling okay, um, of regret or remorse, and, it, and sorrow in itself doesn't produce anything, okay, um, you know, godly sorrow produces something, and that's how you measure godly sorrow, you don't have to be, you don't have to ask yourself this question, well, how sorry do I need to be to know that it's godly sorrow, okay, it's not measured by tears or, or anguish, because everyone has sorrow to different stages, okay, I guess. Uh, but it's measured by the outcome, by what that sorrow produces in you. So you can't say, how sorry do I need to be for it to be godly sorrow? He goes, um, you can tell that it's godly sorrow if it produces in you a repentance. And so the purpose of godly sorrow, again, is to drive you to the cross is to understand what your sin is and how that looks to a holy God and rely on nothing more than the atoning blood of Jesus. So if your sorrow doesn't do that, okay, if your sorrow doesn't make you understand that you alone uh, can do nothing about your sin, but it drives you to rely on the atoning work of God, 
then it will produce this repentance in you. So it's one of the means, I guess you can say, by which God will use to cause us to repent. And again, repentance, you will see fruit. You will, it'll be a change. There will be an action. There will be something that takes place uh, from this godly sorrow. But on the other hand, worldly sorrow, worldly sorrow, what does that mean? Like, you know, well, you know, you can say all day long, I'm sorry I did that. You can even have a remorse that I did that. Um, but, uh, but worldly sorrow has no, cap has no power. It has no capability of healing you from that sin. It, it, it does nothing more than um, uh, to make you feel maybe worse and worse and worse about yourself. And you can't do anything about it. And what happens with that ultimately you end up in self-pity. Uh, maybe you resent something. You, a lot of times what happens if, if you don't address your, your sorrow, your grief, your sins from, with this godly grief is you, you continue in your sin, okay? And you continue to um, then maybe begin to justify that sin. Well, you know, I did it because he said this to me first. I did it because you made me do that. And so they continue and they begin to justify it. And then pretty soon they become the victim. Okay, um, <clears throat> So they think that they've been wrong. And so that then they become, again, into this uh, self-pity, uh, resentment. Uh, that is all that worldly, that, that addressing your, your sorrow for sin in a worldly manner can do. It has no healing power. It's not mediated by the Spirit, which will heal you but it is something that will just continue you on and on. Resentment, depression, you know, even death. You know, like Judas. I mean, we talked about that a minute ago. He was sorry for what he did. He was sorrowful. He tried to go back, but he didn't repent of that sin, and it led him to death. Um, so the Corinthian church demonstrated <coughs> that the letter that Paul wrote had its intended effect. They demonstrated they were truly believers in Christ because they truly had a biblical repentance. They changed their course. It was visible to their interaction with Titus and uh, uh, was visible. So um, Paul, again, when he writes the letter, as we do when we discipline or anything, you write it um, truthfully in love, but there's always that, is it too harsh? There's always that thing, and that's the things you have to pray for, whether it's a child, whether it's a, a church discipline, whether it's a, a spouse that has, has left you and gone astray. All those things, that when you address it, you, you, you worry about that. And <clears throat> it comforted Paul to know that his letter had that intended effect, that God, that they experienced a godly grief that drove them to repentance to the foot of the cross, uh, in, in their salvation. So, so that is kind of the characteristics of repentance and, and grief and uh, sorrow that, uh, that sin does to us. Next week, we're going to look at the remainder of this verse, which really kind of says, kind of gives the characteristics of truly repentant people. Okay, because that's something, you know, that... that, that you can address people, are, you know, are they truly repentant, or are they just saying they are? So what are some of the characteristics you can see in them um, of truly repentant people? Okay, does anybody have anything they want to add to that? Okay, let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you again for this time that we can open your word. We thank you that salvation is all of you, and we don't rely on ourselves or our works or what uh, our thoughts and feelings. That you've implanted your spirit in us. Um, and that through that and guidance, we can truly follow you. We can repent of those things we do wrong. And we can turn back towards you. Because it all comes down to the, uh, the atoning work your son did at the cross. So Lord, thank you so much for that. Uh, be with us as we worship in your son's name. Amen.